Okay. So I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome members to the Executive Office Committee meeting for today. The uh, meeting is obviously, as ever, being recorded and broadcast. Um, so if I could ask if all members ensure that their microphones are on mute whenever they are not participating, that just saves any feedback coming back through and also anybody saying something that they don't want to get heard. Um, so if members could do that, please, and if you could use if it's available, the raised hand function at the side. Is there anybody that's on at the minute that doesn't have access to the raised hand? Okay. Ironically, Emma's raising her hand to tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm having to through person. my browser. So there maybe is a way, but I don't know how to do it. That's okay. I think there is difficulty whenever it's done through the browser. So look, we, we'll, we'll maybe call you in for and, and ask you directly at each stage if you want to ask anything. I'll just make a note of that for myself because I will forget later. Um, okay, perfect. Thank you, uh, Emma. Um, okay. Um, right, so maybe if we could start with apologies. Do we have any apologies? No apologies, Chair. Uh, no apologies at the minute. Okay. Then in terms of a chairman's remarks, maybe I would just like to note um, the passing of Jimmy Spratt, who was an MLA from 2007 to 2015 and was a member of the two predecessor committees, um, the Committee of the Centre and the Committee of the Office of First Minister and, and Deputy First Minister. So both of those committees were prior to this, the Executive Office Committee. So we just offer our condolences to... Uh, Mr. Spratt to his family and to his friends. Um, secondly, then, maybe just to update members that um, the Minister for Environment, Edwin Putz, has returned to his post, uh, which has re left us with Gordon Lyons returned to his post as Junior Minister in the Executive Office Committee. So um, we just uh, to highlight that, to welcome Gordon back again and also uh, to thank uh, Gary Middleton, uh, who stood up and, and was presenting to us there recently uh, while he was uh, carrying out that role. Um, then move to item three, which is the draft minutes. Um, they're on page six of the meeting pack. Are members content that they are a true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting? Yep. Okay. Uh, right, well, then we can get those signed. In terms of matters arising, uh, that following last week's evidence session on the High Street Task Force, the clerk is preparing a paper outlining the main themes and issues raised, and we'll bring it to the committee on the 24th of March for consideration. I think there were a number of actions that maybe were coming from that, from the various working streams and people that we met, and there may be a way that we would be able to, to move forward with that. So uh, we'll get that report ready for our next meeting, and then we can action plan on the back of that from there. Um, Maybe just, I can see that Trevor Lunn has dropped down into the audience and that Martina Anderson is in the audience as well. I think we're moving on anyway to the next element, but just in case they're... Uh, just to get all over the place, Chair. Well, that's, that's, that's the equivalent of getting up in the middle of a meeting and going for a dander. Yeah, <laughs> right, you know? yeah back. not to worry. Okay. Um, look, folks, then, with that all transacted, we're ready to move on to item five, which is the uh, UK exit from the EU and its implications and the Shannon Select Committee on the withdrawal of the UK from the EU. There are information uh, available in the meeting pack from pages 19 to page 186. Maybe if I could ask uh, broadcasting to bring all of the various members of that committee up into the spotlight for us. I think we have most of the numbers there. Um, yeah, indeed. So if I could just ask for two things then at this stage, if I could ask all people present to go on to mute, and that's really important, so if people could just double check that they are on mute. And then if we could ask Lisa Chambers um, to uh, be able to, if her, her microphone is switched on, if I say hello to you, Lisa, if you say hello back to me, it'll bring you up into the spotlight for me. Hi, Colin. How are you doing? Hi Hi. to all of the members as well. Fantastic. That's great. We can see there, Lisa, you and your committee are very welcome uh, with us today. It's uh, somewhat of a return visit. We were with yourselves a few weeks ago. We found it to be 
a, a very um, useful exercise to be able to uh, converse and to discuss uh, and chat about the various issues that we were uh, facing. I think there seems to be an increasing um, reality that by having conversations by by talking and chatting we actually work out what the real problems are uh, as opposed to what the perceived problems are and i suppose the concern is if you live in a bubble then you're only going to find out what's going on around you in that bubble uh, and maybe just if i could say at that stage i'm disappointed that we have no uh, representatives of the dup uh, present here today at this meeting uh you know, some could perceive that it just shows an, an unwillingness or an ignorance to learn what the actual issues are, uh, and it shows a, a lack of will to be able to try and resolve problems uh, and move into a problem-solving mode. But thankfully, the majority of representatives in the Assembly uh, actually are in that space of wanting to try and find pro uh, solutions to the problems, and as grown-ups, we know that that involves having to talk to people and find out what the problems are. So you're very welcome with us today. Um, I'll hand over to yourself um, to make a few opening remarks, and then we'll move into questions and answers, and hopefully it'll allow more of a conversation to take place at that stage. But Lisa, I'll pass over to yourself. Great. Th thanks very much, Colin, to yourself, Chair, to all of the members. And so I'll, I'll make a brief opening statement and then we, we can open it up after that. Uh, so good afternoon. And on behalf of the Shannon Brexit Committee, I would like to uh, begin by thanking all of our colleagues in the committee for the Executive Office of Northern Ireland Assembly and to you, Chair Colin McGrath, uh, for extending an invitation to us, uh, the Shannon Brexit Committee, to discuss uh, Brexit and the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement and other related matters. Uh, the Brexit process, which began in 2019, 2016, has been very difficult uh, for all stakeholders involved and has posed significant challenges for the island of Ireland, our citizens, businesses and our communities. Nevertheless, we as public representatives have a duty to work through those difficulties and work together to ensure that we minimise the negative impact of Brexit for those that we represent. I fully appreciate that there are significant differences in opinion in how we go about navigating Brexit and protecting those we represent. And that is part of the motivation to have these engagement with, engagements with our colleagues in the North. As you'll be aware, Chair, our committee was re-established at the end of last year um, to give a specific and dedicated focus to Brexit and to assess the damage and impact of Brexit post end of transition period uh, on the 31st of December last year. To date, our committee has had a number of meetings spanning numerous topics um, relating to Brexit. Uh, in this regard, we've engaged with the United States Ways and Means Committee through its chair, Congressman Richie Neal, uh, with the Scottish Government uh, through Mike Russell, MSP, with your own committee chair uh, discussing the all-island impacts of Brexit, uh, with the Irish business sector through IBEC, uh, the Irish haulage industry to the IRHA and our main ports, Dublin and Rosslare. Uh, we've also met with the Economic and Social Research Institute, the Data Protection Commissioner, uh, to look at transfers of data between Ireland and the UK. And more recently, we met with the HSE and Kingsbury Hospital in Belfast uh, to look at the impact of the loss of the cross-border treatment directive, which, as you'll know, is, is, is quite uh, well used uh, here in the Republic. The impact of Brexit is so far reaching and permeates so many aspects of life on the island that we still have a considerable amount of work to do before we produce our interim report in July. Uh, the engagement today with your committee chair is, is important on a number of fronts. I think it's good that we each have an opportunity to engage with each other through our own forums, uh, and that we have an opportunity to discuss candidly matters that affect uh, both parliaments and indeed uh, have an all island dimension. But more importantly, Chair, I think it displays that both parliaments are actively working together on behalf of the island, and I look forward to continuing those engagements into the future. So, Chair, we are happy uh, to take any questions and open the discussion between the two committees. And thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to say a few opening remarks. Okay, Lisa, thank you very much indeed for that. And I suppose what we'll do is, uh, as we're becoming more uh, used to these um, interactions and doing so virtually and um, that maybe if, if I start and then other members will join in with a few questions if we direct them to yourself and then you can maybe pass them out 
uh, to members of your committee then to respond in turn or or together uh, and then that might, that will work probably the best if we sort of operate between both of ourselves as chairs to to get the free flow of conversation um and maybe what i could do is begin with a few questions and i suppose the first question maybe then i would ask is you know that the future relationship and the current negotiations are like any negotiations they're sort of based on trust and goodwill on both sides and this week we saw the uk government unilaterally choosing to extend the grace periods to the various timetables for uh, trade relaxations and and i think that extensions like that are necessary but feel that the approach that's been taken by the British government that is a little bit clumsy. So it's just maybe asking to get a sense from yourself whether you feel the methodology that is used of just taking unilateral decisions um, is helpful um, or whether there would be a better way to go about that. Yeah, it's a good question, Colin. I, I, I'm on record as saying that I actually felt that the request for an extension of the grace period was a reasonable request. And it's my understanding that the Irish government were working behind the scenes to try and, and secure that extension. Um, because we could see the difficulties that were being experienced in Northern Ireland, you know, in terms of importing goods and the pressure on business and just adjusting to what is, you know, a significantly new and different trading environment. So I think the the extension isn't really the issue because um, we would have supported that in any event. But I suppose the method and the manner in which it was done, um, you, you know, ha has definitely um, created tensions and made, the, made it a little bit more difficult in terms of implementing the agreement uh, and working together because obviously any unilateral action in, an, in a situation where you have two partners that should be talking to one another, um, you know, isn't, isn't the optimal way of, of doing business. Uh, and it is regrettable, I think, that the, the EU um, intend to issue two letters, um, two parallel legal processes to, to deal with this and to use the mechanisms within, um, within the agreement uh, and through the joint committee to try and resolve the matter. So it, it almost feels, it feels like we're a lot longer into the operation of this agreement than, than just two months um, because so much has happened. Um, but I'm, I'm a firm believer that whilst there are as I would see them teething problems or, you know, a bedding in period, the things can and win, will settle, uh, but it will take political will on all sides for that to happen. Um, and interestingly enough, um, you know, we, we had the Economic and Social Research Institute in before our committee two weeks ago. Um, and one of the points made uh, by that witness was that there was a great opportunity for Northern Ireland and having access to both markets that it could potentially lead to increased foreign direct investment into Northern Ireland, which I think we would all welcome. Um, but if there's uncertainty around the future of the protocol um, and continuing uncertainty as to what the status of Northern Ireland might be in terms of access to both markets, it's difficult to encourage investment and you might actually lose out on that opportunity. So I thought it was an interesting point that um, we certainly took note of at, at the committee. Um, Chair, I actually can't see the other participants on my screen. So can I ask you to maybe see if people have their hands up from my own side, because I'm only getting your shot and uh, maybe I think just your own members. Actually, I can't see the other participants unless that can be made available on the screen. Okay, um, that's certainly an interesting point, yes, because I can see everybody, so I'm, I can't see them. I can see their, their names in the list, so um, we will maybe ask if the, I think if any of the members are in the spotlight, if they just unmute themselves, they can participate. So maybe if another member does have something to add to what Lisa said, if they just want to chip in, we should hopefully be able to, to, to include them. I hope that that means that they're they're happy enough with your comprehensive answer. Maybe to that, then uh, there, Lisa. Yeah, and I suppose Lisa, maybe just thank you for that response. Um, you know, I, I think that take all the points that you're making, and and absolutely again, just reiterating that we've got to stop the solo runs. You know, people need to sit down in a room and work through what the issues are uh, and bring the requests into the room uh, and try and do that in a settled way because that's what's going to allow stability. And and you know, it is. There are very uh, difficult messages being sent out, and if they're mixed messages or incorrect messages, that certainly doesn't help business, and it doesn't help uh, the you know, people and the economy. So that that is something that is quite important. Um, I also uh, 
maybe just to ask then about the change in personnel. Uh, if you feel that it might have an impact, there was the change recently in the UK government side from Michael Gove to Lord Frost. Um, I think it's fair to say that that's a considerable difference, a difference of day and night, uh, potentially, to the approach that's going to be taken um, in uh, the negotiations. And just do you feel that that change of personnel will have any ramifications? Um, it's, it's an interesting political question, uh, Colin. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm reluctant to pass comment on you know individual personalities because at the end of the day, um, you know we respect the appointments made by the Prime Minister, and it obviously is a matter for the UK government who heads up what department and who heads up what project and negotiation. So, of course, we will always work um, with whoever is in situ at, at any given time, and we would expect the same in reverse. Um, so, look, everybody can be. Um, we can work with everybody. Everybody. Um, I think the main thing is that we have open dialogue and continued discussion. And, you know, your first question, you talk about trust and goodwill. Um, you know, and even though it's been a very fraught process the last four years, and it has tested, I think, the relationship um, between both countries, um, you know, we have a very long and, and colourful history. Um, and a lot of trust and goodwill has been built up all over the years. And that doesn't disappear overnight. Um, you know, and the fact remains that the, the UK is still our closest neighbour, our biggest market, um, you know, and, and the cultural and social ties. There's very few families that don't have a, a relative living somewhere in the UK. Um, so that, that link is so strong that, you know, I think we can overcome these things. And, you know, I think a change of personnel really shouldn't impact on that. Um, we should be big enough and, and bold enough to be able to do our jobs professionally, regardless of, of who, the, who the people are. Okay. Um, I'm maybe going to do a test here. Just um, the next person on my list as I read down it is um, from your committee is Malcolm Byrne. Could I just double check maybe Malcolm, if you were just to talk to us for a moment here that we can see you okay and that you're hearing us okay? Yeah, I can I can hear you perfectly, Colin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Malcolm. That's good. So maybe I can just offer out that if there's any any other member uh, from the committee that feels that they want to to participate in an answer, if they just Yep, then they will come into the spotlight and we'll be able to hear them. So, um, okay. Um, Lisa, then my final question, um, maybe somewhat of a curveball, but nonetheless, something that seems to be a result uh, somehow of Brexit and something that is um, being fixated in the British press today is about Boris Johnson's fantasy project of a bridge uh, from uh, Northern Ireland over to Scotland. Um, and we do kind of feel that it is somewhat arrayed on devolution uh, insofar as uh, these are issues and the spend of money uh, would be much preferred uh, to be taken in Stormont as other places. And I was just wondering if you had um, a, a, a thought on whether 20 billion would be better spent on a bridge between Northern Ireland and Scotland or 20 billion pounds worth of infrastructure uh, in the northern part of the island, which do you think would be best? <laughs> oh, that, that is quite the curveball. Um, I, I'm not sure that it's wise for me to, to offer an opinion on that. Um, you know, we have, this, we have similar debates here uh, within our own parliament in terms of infrastructural projects, capital projects, of which should be prioritised and which shouldn't. Um, you know, there's a, there's a couple of projects particularly close to my heart, for example, the Western Rail Corridor, which members may or may not be aware of, um, you know, and you could argue either way. Um, but from, for, for many of us, it's something that we're passionate about and it, sometimes it can maybe a little bit more heart overhead. So I, I think it really it, it is a matter for those that will be impacted by it. Uh, and, you know, if I suppose if there is a trade off in that, it means you can't do something else. Um, because of that investment, obviously that's a matter for the Assembly to discuss and you should have input into that um, because at the end of the day, uh, these decisions should be taken you know, by the people um, and certainly on behalf of the people. So I think it's probably a, a discussion you, you, you may want to have within your own parliament um, as to the merits or demerits uh, of, of that particular project. But it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, you know, it's, it's, you, you, it's certainly ambitious uh, and... You, you can't you can't say that there's not some vision there, um, but yeah, I think it's a it, it'll probably be one that you'll be discussing for for many years to come. I think. Yeah, uh, Colin. Uh, yes, go on ahead. Now, Donald, you here. Uh, I understand and appreciate the diplomacy uh, of the chair, uh, so I made offer uh, a view on that. 
um, respectfully, uh, I say it's it's a bit of a pipe dream. It's a bit of a distraction in terms of the immediate issues that people uh, are facing. It probably is also uh, an effort to cover the blushes of some of those who advocated uh, for the Brexit they're now dealing uh, with the fallout of. Um, I agree with you that there are a number of uh, major infrastructure projects agreed, of course, on a cross-border basis. So there is responsibility for the Irish government in terms of input here, uh, in terms of some of those uh, big uh, keystone projects. Um, so, uh, of course, it could be much uh, better uh, in terms of improving uh, right across our infrastructure, whether that's road and, and more sustainable uh, transportation infrastructure, whether that's real and the connection, uh, as Lisa Reddy mentioned, in the west and, uh, and through up into the northwest and connecting uh, all parts uh, of the island. I think that for very logical and very sound political and economic reasons uh, and very justifiable reasons, I think, for anyone, uh, that is where the, the focus needs to be. But we do and should have, have an input uh, in there from an Iraqis perspective. Uh, and I think certainly the what has been agreed in the programme for government here in Dublin in terms of the narrow water bridge, in terms of the A5 and those projects, uh, and indeed longer term projects around even in this state, the uh, Ireland 2040. Uh, program. Uh, I don't think any of that uh, would really include uh, a bridge to Scotland, which all of the experts that I have heard are are ruling uh, out of order in terms of the technical the, the technical uh, ability uh, to do so. So I think it's a wee bit of a, a distraction, um, and there's probably for us. I, I think, Colin, if you will direct me. One of the issues that I thought maybe we could uh, look at today while we have the chance would be this issue of mutual recognition of qualifications, both north and south, and indeed between uh, Ireland uh, and Britain. Uh, I had done some engagements, and I know other colleagues across the parties have done some engagements with the, the CBI, and we're hoping to hear from them at our, our own committee about this anomaly and about this unresolved uh, issue going forward. So. Certainly, the Irish government have made very clear commitments, as did the British government, uh, although uh, whether they're as credible on them, uh, I'm not so sure. But there has been commitments made around protecting uh, the all-Ireland economy, about protecting the Good Friday Agreement. And for me, a, a obvious, an obvious outworking of that has to be uh, assurances that there will be mutual recognition of qualifications and that will be uh, resolved in order that people can uh, work uh, freely uh, across the entirety of, of Ireland and indeed move between uh, Ireland and Britain. So that's perhaps something, uh, Chairs, that we could maybe, because it is a north-south and indeed east-west issue, uh, as well as us doing our own bit of work on it as a committee column, it's maybe something that both our committees could, could take uh, uh, forward uh, as a bit of a joint project. Uh, Colin, if I if I can come in, or yes, sorry, Colin, uh, it's it's a bit just odd on the screen as to who you can uh, who you can see and whether you're you're, you're being uh, heard or not. And it's following on because I certainly agree around the mutual uh, recognition of qualifications, but I think the whole area of cooperation in the higher education and research space uh, is something that's going to be really crucial as well. Um, the very welcome investment in Derry and Straban, and, and particularly in uh, you know the, the medical school for Derry, but I think also, uh, and it's quite interesting, a lot of the investment that's happening in artificial intelligence, uh, in future technologies in the region, there can be great synergies operating north south. Uh, one of the one of the things about you know these islands is that we share an awful lot in common in the higher education and research space. Um, there, you know, the peer reviews are carried out. Uh, academics will, will freely go between, uh, between institutions. And it's important that we look at ways that we can continue to do that, both north, south um, and, and east, west. Uh, and I think any help and, and support in that, and certainly uh, rather than necessarily the, the Boris Bridge uh, to look at, you know how we can provide educational opportunities, particularly given that the, the pace of change, technological change is is going to be crucial. Um, I think one other issue, which uh, and, and Lisa mentioned, uh, you know, we met with the data protection commissioner here, uh, and where it will be an issue of concern. Um, the European Union will shortly be making an adequacy decision around the UK's uh, data protection uh, and data storage regime. Now, we're working on the basis that the UK's data regime will remain 
roughly the same as the Irish uh, regime. But if there is any divergence, um, that will present huge difficulties for cross-border business, uh, you know, for sharing of medical information and so on. And I know the DPC here, we're talking, you know, we're talking about it, the administrative burden. Um, and that's something that's going to really impact that if there is any divergence uh, between North or South, we are going to be in, in trouble. And I think it is certainly an area that we need to watch. Okay, thank you for that, Malcolm. I'm going to pass on now to uh, questions uh, from other members of the committee, and I would ask first for the Deputy Chair, for Doug, if you have any questions you want to ask. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you all who, who are on here. It's, it's always good to engage, uh, and as the uh, only unionist uh, here, um, uh, then I feel it's important to make sure that I put across uh, my points um, candidly, uh, forthrightly, um, uh, so people understand. Um, first of all, can I say something uh, and be absolutely clear? If I thought this was going to be a meeting where we're going to denigrate my government about a bridge or study of a bridge, um, then I wouldn't be here. Uh, that's a sovereign decision. Now, whether you agree with it or we don't agree with it, they will make that decision. Uh, I thought Lisa's answer was absolutely the answer that should have been given, and we shouldn't have been talking about this. Uh, I think it's pretty disgraceful. I want that put on the record that we shouldn't have been talking about the bridge. That's not what this meeting uh, is for. Um, but Lisa, can I ask you, please? Um, you are going to do a report, and I think that report is is is, is really important. Uh, can I ask how you are going to reflect in that report um, unionist concerns, particularly about the protocol, uh, how the unionist concerns uh, have been sneered at by your government, uh, how their opinions have been ignored uh, by your government. Can I also ask how you intend to reflect in your report uh, how your government used the threats of violence um, to influence the outcome uh, of the Brexit negotiations in regards to the trade and cooperation agreement? Uh, and can I also ask how you intend to reflect how the alternatives to the protocol um, were looked at uh, and dismissed uh, so candidly? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Doug. And it, it's great to have you on the meeting and certainly really appreciate getting a unionist perspective. Um, and as I said in my opening remarks, you know, I fully appreciate that there are, are quite significant um, differences in, in viewpoints on this issue and how we go about navigating Brexit. So I just want to say that I do respect that uh, and fully appreciate that you're coming from a different perspective on this. Um, and and that's, that's good to hear that. So uh, some of the questions I, I'll, I'll be able to answer, maybe some better than others, um, just in terms of how we reflect the unionist views of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, first of all, the fact that we've even had engagement with you, Doug, this today will make a difference because at least I've got direct, uh, you know, um, expressions of views from somebody from that community. Um, when we didn't have a meeting with your committee, uh, there was an invitation to our committee a number of weeks back. We didn't have that unionist voice. And actually, I think that the majority of our members expressed um, a disappointment that we didn't get to hear from somebody because we, re we really wanted to hear that side of things. Um, and we would have expressed at, at that meeting as well, Doug, that we very much understood the differing views and that we were to respect those views. So uh, I will certainly uh, do my best as chair of the, of the committee to make sure that those views are, are reflected as best I can. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, we have a number of other engagements yet to, to have before we report in July. Um, so we are hoping to have uh, more engagements with um, organisations uh, kind of north and south that, that, that span north and south with a hope and a view to getting those perspectives. Um, so hopefully we'll have a bit more to put into the report than we do have to date, uh, if I'm being honest about it. Um, but uh, I suppose it's quite well publicised, um, the difficulties that, that the unionist community have with the protocol. And, and I do understand them, actually. I, I get where you're coming from. Um, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not living your experience, but I, I, I understand why your community is not happy with it. Um, it makes sense, actually, from your perspective. Um, but I, I'm not sure that the Irish government can do a whole lot to address all of those concerns. But I do think we have to try and do something. Uh, and I would have expressed views previously that, you know, the difficulties that we're having now with trade in and out of Northern Ireland, that, that has to be fixable. You know, that seems like the, that seems like a solvable problem that we just need to lock heads together, um, you know, rather than, uh, you know, being, I suppose, 
well, rather than be challenging one another, we should try and work together to try and resolve those issues. And I do appreciate that there are concerns. And that's why I would have said that the extension of the grace period was actually a sensible suggestion from the UK government and I would have very much supported that. Um, might not agree with how it was achieved, but um, I think it was the right outcome uh, in terms of actually giving that extra time to communities and businesses in Northern Ireland. Um, in terms of the Irish government's actions leading up to Brexit happening, that's not really a focus of our committee. We were kind of we were established towards the end of last year, really with the focus of looking at you know now that Brexit has happened, now that we have the trade and cooperation agreement in place, what is the impact of that on the island across all sectors, business and communities? So we're not really looking back the way because I think we've had that debate, we've had that argument, and you know I, I suppose we're looking to the future to see how do we make this work and how do we minimise the negative impacts that we can see from Brexit on all communities. Uh, and that includes the Indianist community. Uh, I think we have a, um, a responsibility to reflect that in our report as well. So um, I suppose the proof will be in the pudding, Doug, when it's published. Um, um, but certainly take on board your views today and, and, and thank you for expressing them. And we'll do my best to make sure that they are reflected in our report. And Chair, I'm not sure if other members want to, to, to come in or... Any other members wish to come in there to answer that? No one. Yeah, if I could come in. Yeah, one of the... In, in the last... Uh, term of the Iraq, that's one of the great strengths we had in the Shannad and indeed the Brexit committee was we had a unionist member um, who reflected, not great uniformly, Doug, but who gave a unionist analysis and a unionist perspective. So in the upcoming by-election for the Shannad, we have the opportunity to put a, a unionist voice back in the Iraq, and I hope uh, members across the board uh, take that opportunity up because I think that's one way certainly that this committee and indeed the institutions overall that uh, would benefit from actually tangibly um, putting those words in the action to ensure that we have uh, those unionist voices represented there, or at least some of them. The more the merrier, says I. Um, Chairman, yes, go ahead, Michael. Michael McDougall here. Um, uh, just going back to um, uh, what Doug was saying there about the, uh, you know, the uh, concerns of the unionist community. I mean, um, I don't sneer at all at the, at the concerns. I, I agree completely um, with uh, uh, what Lisa is saying. You know that we are listening, that we are sympathetic to um, to uh, any group in, in, on the island of Ireland who feels um, discomforted or worse as a result of of, 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 um, of, of the uh, outworkings of Brexit. I just want to say a couple of things. I mean, it seems to me that the um, I want to agree with Lisa on this. It seems to me that the uh, um, the uh, political process leading to the actual decision um, uh, in December and, uh, and the terms on which Brexit was 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 finally accomplished uh, did in fact create a kind of a, a time emergency, and uh, it was possibly a bit naive to think that you know from the first of January onwards uh, that um, the new arrangements would. Uh, come into effect smoothly, and um, from that point of view, I agree with Lisa that you know um, the uh, relaxation of the implementation periods and the grace periods is is, is probably a, a sensible thing to have happened. Uh, however, uh, whether it's done unilaterally, which I don't like very much, but uh, um, uh, or whether it's done by agreement, I think that uh, there's a, there's a common sense to. Um, uh, easing, easing new arrangements into existence. But the other thing, listening to the, um, you know, looking at the uh, footage uh, on uh, BBC Northern Ireland, uh, uh, which uh, I watch uh, quite a lot, um, uh, of empty supermarket shelves, I'd, I'd like to know, is that still, I'd ask, I'd ask uh, Doug to say, is that still a, a serious problem? You know, are there empty supermarket shelves now, or was it, was it a, a temporary blip in respect of um, you know, um, paperwork with uh, Sainsbury's and others, um, uh, and, and Marks and Spencer's just not getting uh, on, on top of, uh, of administrative issues. Um, a second thing that I, I just like, want to say is, uh, uh, you know, the idea that plants can't be um, moved uh, from uh, Britain to uh, Ireland, uh, to Northern Ireland in particular, without removing the soil from them. I mean, these are the kind of issues which I think common sense uh, um, would uh, suggest should be should be addressed in a common sense kind of way. Uh, I mean, I don't feel under threat from British soil uh, coming in either on the tire of a truck or on the bottom of a, a, um, a plant into Northern Ireland and then into the south 
uh, um, uh, thereby uh, prejudicing the European Union. And likewise, things like um, Scottish seed potatoes. Um, I mean, I know that there are people in Ireland, in the Republic, who um, are seriously uh, affected by um, by uh, problems in relation to importation of, of those products. So, I mean, it, it isn't as if they're all just unionist concerns. The, all of the paperwork concerns also apply, by the way, in Dublin and in Ross Lair as well. So, um, uh, we're, we're, we're not, we're not, um, uh, you know, um, um, on, on opposite sides of, of experience in relation to these matters. And I do want to stress that, you know, uh, practical outcomes are the important thing. And just as the, um, uh, as Lord Frost's appearance may have uh, betokened a slightly frostier approach to, uh, to what Michael Gold would have would or would not have done, um, I don't really think that um, starting legal actions now in the European uh, Court of Justice really adds very much to the price of eggs. I, I think we should just sit down and work out exactly what the problems are and what are the common sense solutions to them. Because it is, as Lisa said, very, very important, I would say, that uh, uh, Northern Ireland has the best of both worlds, that it has, that it makes an, um, a virtue of, 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 uh, of the... Uh, the uh, status that it has under the product protocol. Um, and you did say, Doug, you know, uh, and, and I agree with Lisa, we shouldn't go back over it all, but there were alternatives to it and they were rejected uh, um, by, uh, particularly with the support of a party that's not represented at this committee today. Uh, but simply, uh, I mean, uh, we know that um, the, the last Prime Minister tried her best to avoid um, uh, some of the things that have happened since. So I'm just saying, um, we want to hear. We want to. We want to listen. We want to understand. We want to see what the the reality of this is. I mean, um, you mentioned threats of violence in the past, and we see um, uh, graffiti up on walls. That surely, and, and we, we hear about loyalist uh, paramilitary uh, bodies sort of um, uh, becoming concerned about the whole matter again. That's surely um, not of much help. Surely the, the, the priority now is for us all simply to concentrate on ironing out all of the, um, uh, the administrative problems which are there and taking common sense uh, uh, decisions to, uh, to minimize disruption and trade between these islands and across the board and, and to ensure that there aren't disruptions uh, um, between the two parts of the island. That's my top word, but I, I want to say that nobody is sneering at the unionists as far as I know. Um, uh, and um, I, I think that there is a genuine understanding that that, that um, this is um, how would I put it unsettling for unionist sentiment. And the big thing now is just to, if it is all a matter of paperwork and the like, uh, apart from soil and the, and the soil samples and, and seed potato, if it is that, let's just minimise all the problems and uh, and um, uh, address this in a common sense way. I think that's how most people. In the Republic, if you want to know, Doug, actually deal with this. They're not hostile to the Unionist parties, to the Unionist community, rather, on this. Um, they, might, they might be critical of what the DUP did in the past, but um, uh, that's history, and we'll, we'll, let's get on with it now. Okay. Thank, thank you, Michael. Martina, I'm maybe going to ask yourself to come in at this stage, because I know that you need to, to go away, um, and we've probably... We've, a lot of replies there so maybe if i let yourself come in and then we'll go back to doug and then we'll we'll move on from there if that's okay please uh thank you and thank you uh doug for for letting me in and i'll have you to pop out and come back in again um i suppose uh, i just want to say at the outset you know there should be no no go areas when it comes to conversation in relation to anything that affects the 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 island and uh, north or south and, um, and I think it's just commentary and I welcome that here in the views expressed um, in relation to whether it's a bridge or Brexit or, or anything else. <clears throat> like the scale of the damage done to, to lives and livelihoods caused by Brexit uh, and the Brexit mess is absolutely breathtaking. Um, not just in the south of Ireland, but particularly uh, in the north of Ireland. And some of that, Lisa, and I say to you as the chair and others and members, has yet to play itself out. You know, the British government has already binned the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. 
which prevents, as you would know, discrimination on, on the various grounds, including uh, disability across across the, the north, regardless of what community you come from. Um, and in the north, we have the lowest standards of human rights protection and very much dependent on uh, on EU directives, even though they are the floor and not the ceiling. And I know we have the chair of the Bill of Rights Committee on this uh, from our end, and she knows more about it than any of us. Um, in relation to the EU protection under threat, you have maternity leave, workers' rights, consumer rights, environmental protection. And those are all concerns uh, across a number of sections in society that we hear people engaging with. Obviously, there's been a focus on, um, on the, the border in the Irish Sea. We all knew that were any of us that was really interrogating this knew there was going to be a border somewhere. And unfortunately, we were ex- accused of scaremongering. When, when we outlined what was going to happen. And we need to try to deal with this in a way that's going to take us all forward. I've been following some of the meetings that you've been doing at the and I know that you have met around that issue recently, water health treatment directive. That's something that constituents, regardless of you coming from the unionist community, the Republican community, or any other tradition and none, that the people on the ground are starting to realise the impact of Brexit. So those that would look to, for instance, go to Navin for a hip replacement, for instance, from the north, are realising that they can no longer do that. And I know you, uh, you had a meeting recently in relation to that, so I wouldn't mind finding out more about that. The recognition of qualifications, as Nyla said, is crucially important to my own constituency of Derry. Derry and Letterkenny Institute who are working hand in glove, and there's a number of issues, even when we deal with the potential opportunity of, invent- uh, of investment around hydrogen, and we need to have the recognition of qualifications uh, across uh, across this island. And then we have the issue of SMEs, and I'll end with this, the SMEs um, in the north, uh, 90% with them, of them uh, trade across the island on an all Ireland basis. And, you know, we have 80, 90% of the economy here is uh, is made up of SMEs. So it's crucially important that we try to ensure that the all Ireland supply chain is maximized as we are as we are going forward and where we can get trade. So the shelves that people have talked about, whatever about the initial reaction because of the lateness of the deal that was done, um, we have certainly. Uh, I know in my constituency, we haven't had, uh, we hadn't had much problems with going into supermarkets to empty shelves or whatever. That certainly hasn't been the situation as it has rolled on. It seems to have resolution seem to have been found, and uh, and that seems to be how trade and business will find a route to resolve the problems that they have encountered. So. Lisa, if I could pass that to you, maybe for one or two members from your committee, maybe to give a response to that, just... Yeah, th- thanks very much, Colin. Um, so, uh, so just to respond to a couple of the issues that Martina raised, um, you know, I mean, we, we've heard the concerns uh, of citizens in Northern Ireland at the potential, I suppose, maybe reduction in, in access to certain rights. Um, uh, and we hear that, and that, that was a significant part of the debate, I think, in the lead up to Brexit. Um, it is one of those areas where I suppose we we don't have huge control over that uh, in the Republic, but I'm I'm not so sure that the the UK government are that intent. I think on you know on, on removing maternity rights or workers' rights, but I think it is one of those things that it will require monitoring over a period of time. Um, in terms of the cross border treatment directive, you're right, Martina. We did have a discussion on that. Uh, on Monday. Um, so we heard from the HSE and we heard from Kingsbridge Hospital in Belfast as well. And we also heard from uh, PD4, the representative association for the enlisted ranks in the Defence Forces, because they have a, th- a scheme that was set up on the basis of the directive. Um, there is a, an administrative process that's there currently, a kind of a sticking plaster, as I would have referred to. So you can still access healthcare cross jurisdiction and get reimbursed so there is a system in place that's 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 been put there for these 12 months for this year until we can find a more permanent solution but it does seem to be fairly positive indications from uh, the department and from government um, that there is a desire and an intention to put something on a more permanent footing 
uh, beyond those 12 months. And we are keeping a close eye on it because I would agree with you that it is, you know, that, that that's an issue that's of concern to everybody, regardless of your political affiliation or none. Um, you know, access to healthcare is, is a top priority. So that, I think, um, is one of those things we can solve with common sense and just putting in place a new system. And, you know, we discussed on Monday about maybe putting in place an improved system uh, since we're not confined by the directive. Let's do something that actually uh, makes it work better for, for the patient. Um, uh, so I, I think we've got a little bit of time, but certainly we would like to see something permanent put in place before the end of the year and that we wouldn't run up to a, a, a cliff edge or a deadline for when that expires. Um, I might hand off then, Colin, to other members that may want to come in on that. Yeah, thanks, uh, Lisa, uh, and thanks, Colin. I mean, I suppose the important thing, I, I appreciate what, what Archer is saying in terms of ha having to navigate some of this, and certainly in, in terms of our own work uh, as committees, we, we, it's, it's good to identify some of these issues and then perhaps uh, formulate, help formulate some of our own future work going forward. But I mean, one of the key things to remember here is that the British government have already removed the Charter of Fundamental Rights. It's gone. Um, so that is that is a, a loss, as Martina has, has rightly said, and, and they've already stated publicly. Likely uh, that they're looking at lower a lower standard of workers' rights. So that I mean that 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 is an immediate issue of concern. That that I, I don't know that we can just kind of tinker around the edges of that. I think we need to be sort of upfront uh, as committees and indeed as political representatives in terms of how we uh, work to address that loss uh, of of rights and entitlements from uh, a political decision that was actually contrary to ours. Um, so. Yeah, go, going forward, uh, chairs, I, I do think again, much like the issue of the mutual recognition that I suggested earlier on, there perhaps is a, a, a bit of engagement uh, that's worth doing with the, the trade unions, uh, for example, even with uh, the the, the uh, departmental officials who are relevant north and south, and to, to get some uh, regular engagement and regular updates just on this gradual, uh, steady uh, continuation because they say the charter's already gone, but this continuation of the removal of, of, of rights and protections for, for workers. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Niall. Is there anybody else that wants to come in to respond to that? Okay, that's fine. Thank you. So thank you, Martina. Um, Doug, we could go back to yourself there then. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you, Martina, for being being brief. Um, uh, and Lisa, apologies, you, you're stuck with me a little bit here, but I think because being the only unionist here, I think it's really important that I try and get uh, a point across while, while I get the opportunity, because you'll have lots of friendly voices following on after me, I guess. Lisa, I suppose one of the big issues we've got, and, and it has been explored before, but it probably needs to be explored again, is the whole issue about identity and the fine balance that we have uh, in Northern Ireland, um, uh, which was brought about by uh, the Belfast Agreement, which which my party helped uh, negotiate with the SDLP. Um, and that fine balance would have been upset if we had put in a hard border uh, on the island of Ireland. Uh, and that fine balance has been upset by the IRC border uh, and the protocol. Uh, and there's been huge damage done to community relations. Uh, there's huge damage done uh, to North-South cooperation. And, and you can see that just today. I mean, the DUP aren't here. I wish they were here. But the reality is that's a, an outworking of a protocol which they, they don't support. Uh, so, you know, we, we can argue that we wish they were here to give a really strong unionist voice, but they're not here. And that's an outworking. So the cooperation North and South uh, is being damaged also. Uh, and the Belfast Agreement it is being damaged uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and let me give you an example for, for so, so you understand the, where I'm coming from. And, and Michael will be interested in this one because this is where we apply common sense. So a fishing boat in Kilkeel leaves its, it leaves its berth and goes out to fish. And because it's left its port, it's classed as being in a third country. To return to Kilkeel, it has to do a customs declaration. Now, that is not only ridiculous. It is absolutely against um, the Belfast Agreement and the spirit of the Belfast Agreement. And I'll say this by speaking, and I got this from speaking to that fishing sector, who I'll say to you, who are actually making inroads into making the protocol work for them. But that particular issue is, 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 is a real travesty. 
So how are we going uh, to reflect that in your report and, and how are we going to look at that as we go forward? How are we going to look at the fact that uh, a dog going from Northern Ireland to, to uh, a cross show in, in England, when it comes back, it needs a passport? That doesn't affect the single market. Soil doesn't affect the single market. Um, if the issue is chlorinated chicken, we don't want chlorinated chicken uh, in the EU single market. I, I mean, I bulk at the th thought of chlorinated chicken, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, thousands of people from Ireland and across Europe go to America. And I'm sure they eat chicken. They don't have a problem with it. But if the issue is chlorinated chicken, then we ban chlorinated chicken. Um, so so can, you, can, can you see the concerns that people really have? But this damage to community relations, and it is a damage to community relations, and it's going backwards rapidly, uh, and this damage to the Belfast Agreement, um, because the protocol does not protect the Belfast Agreement, it damages the Belfast Agreement. So, so how do we look at that? How do we reflect that? And how do we understand that slightly better? Colin, will I, will I come in back in there? Yeah. Um, Doug, I, I'm finding it hard to just, I don't disagree with you, actually. Um, I just don't have an answer or a solution to the problem. I actually agree with you that the protocol, had it, had it not been there, if we had a border on the island, we would have damaged the Good Friday Agreement and we would have had this tension. But I also accept, actually, um, that having what is effectively a border in the Irish Sea between Northern Ireland and Great Britain also causes damage. I, I fully accept that. Uh, and I'm not sure what the solution is. I, I've had it put to me previously um, that we should put the border between Ireland and mainland Europe, and that would solve all of the problems. But then that would create a problem for the Republic. Um, and as you know, we are committed members of the European Union, and we, we value that, that free access. And we're, we're quite proud of that, that long, you know, we're 45 years now a member of that club, and we, we want to stay there. Um, so, I mean, this is what we've been racking our brains about for the last four years is how do we square that circle? Um, and I, that, that's why I, I, I get it, because I think that the UK government had a very difficult decision to make because it wanted to get a trade deal with the European Union. Um, and and that, that was the compromise that was reached. Um, but it doesn't suit. I fully accept it does not suit the, the unionist community. Um, so I'm not going to you know, lay out the platitudes here and, and say it's all going to be fine. And, you know, I, I do think there are there are things we can work on. I mean, this idea of a customs check because you've taken your, your small boat out from the port and you want to come back in to, to dock again. I mean, that is ridiculous. They're the kind of things that we can fix. Um, as Michael McDool has pointed out, the issue around soil being attached to the plant. I mean, that's just daft, really, isn't it? So they're the things that we can fix, but it still doesn't... I, I think that the, the, the issue for the unionist community, if you don't mind me saying, and I'm not a member of that community, so I hope you don't mind me taking liberties with saying this, it's... I mean, they're the annoyances, but it's the ideological aspect of it. It's the fact that there's a border there. No matter how big or small it is, there are extra checks. And I'm, I am concerned that even if we fix all of these annoyances, if, if I can call them that, that it's still not going to fix the problem we've discussed around the tensions between communities in Northern Ireland and North-South relations. And I, to, right now, today, I don't have an answer to that, um, only that I hope that we can get past it. And I think we've been through worse in the past and we've come through it um but i can fully understand why you're saying the things you're saying and why you're feeling those things and that's why i would would join with with senator mcdool in saying that we're not sneering because we know it's a big problem uh, and we're concerned about it um and we are really sympathetic about it but uh, tea and sympathy isn't going to fix the problem yeah and, and if i could just quickly come back on that lisa and if anybody else wants to, to, to come in and to be absolutely clear i'm saying this to you if you were the northern Ireland affairs committee i'd be saying it to them so this is you know i'm not directing it at you because you know, you're the irish government i would be directing it to anybody who created this um frankenstein solution when there were other solutions uh, available solutions that we have put forward uh, ourselves um you know alternatives arrangements, which, which only was released its report in July 2019, yet by December 2019, we'd come up with this with this protocol. Um, and you're absolutely right in something you say, and that is, even when you fix all of these small issues, the very fact is that within our country of the United Kingdom, we have a border. You know, it, it's not going to fix it. Um, and, and I say this as somebody who voted Remain, you know, I voted Remain. I wanted to remain, but I haven't stopped being a unionist 
just because uh, I didn't get my way. I am still a unionist, and therefore it's the Union of Northern Ireland and Great Britain, which makes up the United Kingdom. And somebody has put a border in between the two. So until the protocol is gone, you're absolutely right. Then we'll, we'll not be resting to get rid of that. And even the vote in four years doesn't allow us to get rid of the protocol. It only allows us to get rid of Articles 5 to 10 of the protocol for something else to be reinserted to, to, take, its, to take its place two years after that. So it'd be 20, 20, 2026. So it's it's trying to come up with something that that better meets the aspirations of people in in Northern Ireland, um, you know, regardless of what community you come from. And there is alternatives out there, um, but those alternatives have have not been looked at. Uh, and and I'm concerned that people just thought they were too difficult and just got rid of them um, because they were too worried about violence along the border. I'm not worried about violence in Larne or violence in Balamina uh, or violence anywhere else, just violence along the border. So, so that's my concern. But, but, but you're right, until the protocol's gone, the unionists probably won't stop shouting. Okay. Malcolm, I think, were you looking to come in there? Did I see you indicate? It, it, it's it's slightly, slightly moving the issue, Colin, if, if, if I may, which, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose Doug might be able to, you know, input on some of that as well we're obviously looking at you know the impact of, of brexit on the republic and particularly on, on 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 the island but we've got to be conscious about around bigger questions as well and i suppose this is around the constitutional makeup of the uk and particularly the future of scotland and there are very strong connections, obviously, between uh, the unionist community in Scotland, but equally, you know, between uh, everybody on, on, on these islands. Um, what consideration do you think that we should give should the future constitutional position of Scotland change? Well, that's a, a, that's a huge can of worms, Malcolm. Um, uh, and I'm not sure I can... Sorry, you're throwing it in, in there. I don't think I can give you an answer on that. The first thing I'll say to you is this, um, is that I'm an Irishman. Uh, I'm a very proud Irishman. Uh, I've always identified as being uh, an Irishman, belonging to the United Kingdom. Uh, and, and I'm a United Kingdom unionist. So therefore, I'm a unionist in Northern Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales. So the loss of any one of those um, component parts of... Of, of my country would be a huge loss to me. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know where, which way Scotland will go. That will be, for them, it will be a democratic vote if it happens or when it happens, uh, in the same way leaving Brexit, leaving the European Union, was a democratic vote. And as I said, myself and my party were for Remain, but we accept the de democratic outcome of a vote. That's what Democrats do. Um, uh, and we would have to do the same with Scotland. Um, but, but uh, you know... I, I couldn't give you an answer of where we would be if that happens, when that happens, because I, I don't even know when or if they will have a, a referendum in any time soon. Okay, Doug, I think you're doing well. It's unfortunate that, as I say, that the other unionist members aren't here, and it feels maybe like questions are being directed at you, but um, thank you for those questions and answers. Maybe if we could move next to Trevor. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I've listened with interest to all this. I'm afraid I missed the last meeting and I apologise for that. But I wouldn't want anybody to think that that was part of a, a DUP boycott or a unionist boycott. I'm an independent member of the Assembly now and perfectly happy to be described as a slightly soft unionist, but that's about as far as I go. The um, and, and the Scottish question has just been asked by Malcolm. Um, now, let's not beat about the bush. I don't, I don't know what way the Scots will, will vote when they get the opportunity. But uh, if, if they are allowed to leave the union, the union is finished. It, it just wouldn't stand scrutiny any longer. And we'd have to work out, as we probably will have to anyway, what, what happens to this part of the United Kingdom in that event, or even if that doesn't happen. The... Uh, uh, Senator McDowell mentioned the supermarket shelves. I know Martina responded to that. Now, at, at the start of the January, there certainly was uh, spaces on our supermarket shelves, particularly the ones that are supplied in large measure from, from England. That would be Marks and Spencer and Sainsbury's in particular. Uh, I can remember my wife bemoaning the fact that she couldn't get Somerset Brie anymore. And uh, for the dead point out there that they could get French Brie, uh, Irish Brie, probably half a dozen other Brie's, but Cornish Brie, but not Somerset. 
Well, I'm happy to report that Somerset Brie is back on supermarket shelves again now. So I think the big the big operators were being a wee bit cautious, but it's been resolved now. The, the, the independent supermarkets didn't really seem to have much of a problem with this at all. The, um, the question of... Uh, I'll get to my real question in a moment, but the question of soil, that this is fascinating to see. All, all over the Belfast newsletter today, we have a, a, a problem, but that's just one of a cloud of problems that have been produced by unionists other than people like Doug, uh, uh, throwing up problems which don't really exist at all. And this particular one is the, the type of soil that cricket pitches need. Over here, now you've got plenty of good cricket pitches down south, probably more than we have. But apparently, the the actual wicket has to be laid in a mixture of soil and uh, clay, which becomes known as loam, and it's imported from the UK. Uh, as far as I know, it, it's imported from the UK, but it, it is sterilised, and I'm sure if we have to continue to import it, it'll still be sterilised. So I don't really see a problem there at all. But that's the type of thing that's being thrown up as uh, impediments to progress. The question I want to ask you, Lisa, um, the business over here, in my opinion, is uh, starting to adapt to our, our perceived problems pr pretty well. Uh, given the short notice from the time of the agreement was, was signed off until the 1st of January, it's hardly surprising that they had certain problems Im immediately. But I think it was Manufacturing NI who did a survey at the end of January, and it was surprisingly positive in terms of resolution of the problems and their optimism for the way forward. And I'm looking forward to the survey that they have completed now at the end of February because this is to be a, a monthly operation, and I expect it to show further progress. Lisa, you mentioned in your introductory remarks that... Um, You've had consultation with all of the business uh, operations and then the Republic. So could I, could I ask you, what, what, um, what's the feedback from Southern business at the moment? Is it, is, is it positive or are they seeing problems similar to ours? Uh, that's, that's the question, really. I just want to know what, what Southern business thinks. Lisa? Yeah, th thanks, Trevor, and um, thanks for your for your comments. Uh, we would have engaged with with IBEC and the food and drink sector. Um, I suppose going back more than a month ago now, um, and they would have been. I suppose a big part of their discussions was on uh, transit in and out of the country. The land bridge was still posing a difficulty. Um, some of the blockages there, and then country of origin issue um, was was posing a difficulty for some component parts, uh, particularly in food produce. So, um, I, I don't think it's a case of. Um, I, I think the difficulties in the Republic were slightly different than that. It was more focused on import and export of goods, the issues around transit and haulage, uh, the additional cost of, of getting goods in and out, and then maybe finding it more expensive or difficult to get products from the UK. Um, where the country of origin was, there's a certain. So, for example, uh, we would have been made aware of an issue around flour, um, where it was being subjected to additional levies because of of Brexit and the fact that it didn't have a certain percentage coming from the EU. So, those types of things. Um, but they they did say that it was a little bit too early yet to assess the overall impact on the business sector. Um, now, we are going to be engaging, um, hopefully in two weeks' time, uh, with Intertrade Ireland, with the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium, to see, to get a bigger picture, really, of the all-island impact on business. Um, but I, I think they were, the biggest concern, really, was that the UK now is a third country, uh, and that was a big market, um, you know, and the impact of that. But I think they were still waiting to see what the outcome of that was going to be, and it would take longer to assess. And the same was really said from the, the Economic and Social Research Institute that they were still assessing the impact because it was so, such early days. Um, we would have had these engagements maybe when the protocol and the, the agreement was maybe four or five weeks in operation. Um, so really in its infancy. Um, so I think slightly different um, difficulties to what the businesses in the North were experiencing. But I'm interested to see here that, that it seems to be a positive outlook. Can I ask Trevor or other members, you know, is there a discussion ongoing around the benefits 
the potential benefits of having access to to both markets is that is, uh, is, is that conversation happening or is it still too early well it, it, it's happening amongst people who would be uh, positive trying to find the best way forward uh, the, the the potential for all Ireland trade and for trade between this part of Ireland and the rest of the EU is is unlimited. But we seem to be concentrating on the particular problems with with cross channel um, trade in, well, particularly from Great Britain. Uh, other members have said that uh, th those things should be capable of resolution. I think they they will one by one. I mean, again, if, if you look back over the last two months, we have actually resolved several of the the problems that people thought were insurmountable. Uh, VAT on steel. Uh, car uh, VAT on uh, um, second-hand cars, complete nonsense anyway, and uh, various other smaller things. you just got to work your way through these things. And I, I think that, you know, the, the majority of the population up here, I think the majority of business community in particular, is, is looking at the way forward, not, not looking backwards. I think it's positive. That's good. Good okay. to hear that. Anybody else wish to respond to, to Trevor's questions? Okay, then maybe I could move on next then to Pat Sheehan. Pat, would you like to? Oh, and then, yeah, we'll go. Well, now I'm pitching Pat versus Emma. <laughs> well, we'll go Pat and then Emma. I still have you on the list, Emma. Uh, th thanks for that, Chair. And uh, uh, first of all, um, Lisa, I, I want to commend you on your restraint and diplomacy when you described the, the British government's unilateral decision to extend the grace period as not the optimal way of doing business. I must remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, uh, we're well used uh, up here to British governments um, doing their own thing and reneging on agreements and so on. I mean, you just have to look at the state of the new decade, new approach agreement, and, and all the parts of that that uh, the British government haven't fulfilled the date. But uh, uh, we've, we've covered quite a bit of ground here. I wanted to focus in on one particular issue, which is the Erasmus scheme. And you'll be aware that Simon Coveney has said previously that uh, students from the North would be able to access uh, Erasmus uh, that the, the Dublin government would uh, sort that out. Um, is there any update on that, Lisa? Do you know? Thanks. Lisa. Not any more than that, Pat. I'm aware that uh, there's between that and the European medical card, there was a desire to, I suppose, extend benefits or maintain benefits rather than extend. Um, so the information that I have to date is that that's, that's going to happen. We had the minister in before our committee in its first week. So that would have been back, well, that would have been January. Um, or, no, sorry, it was December, actually. So it, it, we hadn't got much information at that point, but we're actually going to have an engagement with the Minister for Higher Education, hopefully in the coming weeks. And that's on our agenda, actually, to explore that um, and the mutual recognition of qualifications. So we're, we're hoping to actually have a meeting on that topic um, and it will form part of our report as well. So um, all I can say to you, Pat, is that the, the government are committed to doing it, um, but the actual ins and outs of it, I don't have full details for you today. Okay, thanks for that. And, and just on to a broader issue, and Malcolm, I suppose, opened up the discussion uh, in around constitutional change. And Michael, you said yourself that you, you have sympathy for all those who feel discomfited by Brexit. And I suppose everyone on this island, to one degree or another, has been discomfited by it. Uh, and there are ways and means of resolving the problems that have arisen. And one is for constitutional change. And the issue of Scotland has been brought up and the the uh, demand there for independence and that may or may not happen uh, in, the, in the future. However, the ground is shifting also in the north. Uh, there is uh, demographic changes taking place here. Uh, and at some stage, 
in the not too distant future, there's going to have to be a referendum on Irish unity. And the EU have already said that in the event of Irish unity, uh, the North can re-enter the European Union. And I'm just wondering, in terms of your report, is, uh, is that particular issue going to play any part of that report? But um, uh, first of all, uh, we aren't we aren't our, our, our terms of reference are not so uh, um, so that far. I think as to consider um, uh, the uh, the possibilities that there would be an all Ireland and uh, sorry a, a cross border vote, or that there would be um, uh, a particular outcome to that. The way most people in, in, in Dublin see it, and uh, I think this is a, uh, I think that Neil O'Donnell probably wouldn't agree with, but I mean, uh, most people in Dublin would, would see that um, uh, a, a poll in, in the near future. But first of all, I don't think there will be a poll in Scotland because I think that uh, Downing Street won't allow it to happen. That's my first uh, proposition on, on that. Um, uh, whatever it is, I'm sure that's good or bad. Uh, but, um, uh, I, I, I personally am uh, I'm, I'm very sympathetic with the Scottish Nationalist Party, so I just want to make that point. But uh, in, in Northern Ireland terms, um, uh, one of the things that Pat, I think that uh, those who are calling for a, 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 a poll on, on, on Irish unity should ask themselves, and it's crucial, is, um, you know, first of all, has it a chance of success in the near future in terms of those who are supporting United Ireland? And all the all the opinion poll evidence shows that despite the demographic changes, and I wrote about those demographic changes myself recently in the Irish Times, despite those uh, uh, changes, um, the uh, the majority of those of voting age uh, show no inclination to vote uh, for Irish unity uh, and ask the bare question. And um, the second thing that you have to bear in mind, and I think it's a crucial question for, for, um, for uh, and it's a question that I think that unionists in particular should, should uh, take on board. The idea of Irish unity is not, is, is, is not simply a, an all-Ireland unitary state. Even your own leader, Mary Lou MacDonald, has spoken about the possibility of a confederal uh, Ireland as, as a form of united Ireland. And uh, a confederal Ireland sharing, sharing, say, membership of the European Union. So, um, uh, the, I mean, some people, some people have, have a very simple uh, black and white view of what Irish unity could or would be. Other people think that this is a more complex problem. But um, what I'm saying is that uh, until um, there is some even vague understanding of what form of Irish unity those who are asking for a poll to be held have in mind, until that happens, the chances of a yes vote to Irish unity uh, north of the border, I think, are very, very slim. And I mean, uh, I've looked at the, the demographic data that you referred to there, Pat, um, uh, uh, and, and it, it does appear that, uh, for instance, um, uh, if you want to do a religious head count, uh, Protestants and Catholics will be uh, both in the in the 45 to 48 percent fairly soon in Northern Ireland, and the Protestant majority will be confined to two counties in Northern Ireland. If you want to do a, 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 a religious head count at that time. But um, I, I'm not. I'm, I, I'm just saying this: that religious out, uh, outlooks will not dictate how people will vote in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an Irish unity poll. Um, uh, they, I believe, that the people of Northern Ireland will want uh, to know exactly what is being put up to them. And um, what I say, I mean, I support fully what Michael Martin says that the instead of uh, identitarian politics being. Um, uh, concentrated on and, and, and the um, possibility of an early poll being, being held on, on, on Irish unity. Instead of that, I think it would be far, far better if we concentrated on making the Belfast Agreement work and uh, bedding down uh, the new arrangements, which I think are a huge uh, opportunity for Northern Ireland, and, and, and taking the, the, the foot off the accelerator, if I may put it that way, um, uh, on the constitutional question, because the constitutional question won't be resolved in favour of, of Irish unity, I think, for the best part of 10 years, at the least. 
And I, I, I think that's, that's something that, uh, you know, um, I just want to say that uh, so that Doug would hear that. Uh, yeah. Because, uh, I mean, uh, sometimes people in Northern Ireland might think that, uh, that uh, you know, um, uh, uh, what they're hearing about uh, um, demands for a, a, a border poll um, uh, are um, all, all, of, all kind of one-way traffic in, in the Republic. They're not. They're not. Most people in the Republic want the, the Good Friday Agreement to bed down and to work. That's the priority. And, Mike, uh, could I, and could I, could I come in there just on that point? And we, we, all, we all want the Good Friday Agreement to work, but one part of the Good Friday Agreement is the provision for a border poll. And, and, and let me just say this. Um, you're right. There is no prescribed model for a new uh, unitary state. Um, and that's all the more reason why we need to be talking about it now and not do the same as was done with Brexit when nobody knew or understood or was able to foresee what the actual outcome of Brexit was going to be, not least the DUP, uh, who are now in a bind because they were the cheerleaders for Brexit, and they are the ones who want to cover their own blushes because of the consequences of it. So, you know, instead of putting everything on the long finger, 10 years isn't a long time, Michael. I, I, I think there'd be movement before that, but even even if we go by your time scale, it's only a blink of an eye. So let's start the discussions now. Let's start the preparations now. Uh, and that's that's a way to resolve a lot of the problems that have been created by Brexit. So and I know we could continue this discussion all day, but I'm sure there's others who want to, to get yep. their say as well. Thanks. Jack, could I say something just on the back of Pat's point, would you mind? Um, yes, if it's on the back of Pat's point, then we'll go to Emma for questions. Yes, I'm oh, sorry about this. They, what, what, what has ignited the discussion up here about the possibility of a United Ireland or change in the status of Northern Ireland is actually what we're talking about today, is Brexit. And that's, that, that has upset all the calculations. And they, I, I, I'm slightly involved with the Ireland's Future organisation at the moment, without, without taking a stand one way or the other. And the, the information they're garnering is that there's a, a real interest in this now. And at the time, people discovered what it would actually mean, mean to their well-being and their daily lives. So uh, to, to, to sort of equate it to the religious balance up here, it, it's, it's, it's a nonsense at the moment. But it would only matter if, if, if three-quarters of the population actually started to go back to church, but they don't. I mean, they, you know, they, they just don't. I mean, the church attendance up here is, is, is pretty miserable at the moment on both sides of the fence. Yeah. And as, as well as that, there's a there's a section of the population which must be at least thirty upwards of thirty percent who don't vote. So no point in looking at voting records. But there was those sort of people who would vote in the event of a referendum. Now I do agree with Mr. McDowell that uh, it's not likely to have one within the next five or ten years. But it will it will happen. Public pressure will do it. And I'm a wee bit disappointed by the attitude of the southern government at the time because they seem to be distancing themselves from the very the very notion of having a discussion about it. That's it. Yeah, well, I agree with you. I, I think that it, it, there's no problem discussing things, but uh, going back to, to what Pat was saying there, the Belfast Agreement does provide for uh, a, a border poll, but in the circumstance that it appears uh, likely that a majority um, uh, want a change, and thus far, uh, I think you'd agree with me um, that uh, Trevor, the that, that precondition is not uh, satisfied yet. I mean, no, no harm in discussing things, but as long as it's not seen as a threat to uh, people's identities, even to have a discussion, I, I, I'm very happy to discuss it and have done so at length in various locations. Uh, but I, I, I do believe that anybody who thinks that there's going to be a border poll when we don't know what, uh, what's on the table and what's being proposed, that's very yeah. nice to think that some people are going to buy a pig in the poll. Okay. okay, Emma, would you like to come in now? 
Colin, Thank can I just you. ask, um, Senator Joe O'Reilly is on the call. He sent me a text. Can you just add him to your list? Because I can't see him on the screen. Oh, um, yes, I can, just, I can see yeah. him there. Joe, yeah, just stick him, me, stick him on your list. If you give me a good wave whenever you want to answer, I can see you because I've got the grid view up here. So I can see if people are looking to, to get in there. So um, Emma, if you want to ask your, your question and, and we'll pass it on then. Um, I suppose it's... it's links in very closely with what has just been discussed, um, both Pat's point, um, Doug's comments earlier on in the meeting, um, I, I suppose, I don't think we should be taking criticism of a, of a decision or a potential decision being, being made by the British government so sensitively, or, or people should be reacting, you know, that, that it's that it's an insult to criticise something that they're talking about. We're now having a discussion around Brexit and all the different implications that Brexit's having for all the constituents and people that we represent. A decision that was made by a government in another place, by a majority of people in another place, that's having an impact for us all here on the island of Ireland, regardless of how you identify or what you regard yourself as. Um, so there, there's definitely merit in, in having conversations about these things. I think the, the idea of a bridge or a tunnel link to Scotland or England at the minute is an insult considering what we're going through, the context of the year that we've had and the fact that there is so much infrastructure missing in our own country. And that's north and south. I think about the likes of Donegal that has no real network for mana, vast swathes of, of the northwest of the ban. Um, and we're having fights every day with local uh, infrastructure regional managers around potholes and upgrades of roads and resurfaces that need that have real impact for, for our constituents who in, in the course of trying to get to their work are bursting tires or, or having to, to face these sorts of everyday problems. So to, to to sort of say we dare not we dare not criticize the British government when they're when they're basically insulting us by by trying to distract from the reality of what's happening and their, their handling of, of COVID-19, I, th I think, is is wrong. And following on from that, the conversation that's just been had around the potential of Irish reunification um, and, you know, going into that debate with our eyes wide open, as somebody who advocates for Irish unity and who only ever got involved in, in politics in the first place because I believe that Irish reunification is the most sensible outcome for all the people of Ireland, nobody and that I have met that's that's talking about a, a border poll or having Irish unification wants to do that without knowledge of, of what we'd be walking into. We're, we're talking day and daily about preparing for reunification, preparing for the outcomes of that and, and having a sensible debate that includes everybody, regardless of their background. Doug said earlier that he's a unionist who's also Irish, but we've got unionists who don't identify as Irish and we need to be having that debate in a way that everyone feels safe um, and when, when we talk there I don't know what polls um, Michael is referring to we can see successive um, polling in, in recent years that's telling us that support for Irish reunification is going particularly amongst younger voters the, the exit polls from the free state election last year had support for Irish unity somewhere in the region of 70 percent um, from, from voters on that day so we, we we can see all the problems that we've had um, as a result of Brexit, and that was because people made an uninformed decision. And I think that regardless of how long it takes us to get to the point where we have that referendum, we need to be having an informed debate and we need to be talking about all these things. So I think this this engagement is really, really good. And this is an, a, an opportunity for us all to be looking for solutions and looking for ways that we can best represent the people that we do represent. And all of those things have to be on the table. And those conversations have to be open and people need to feel that they can raise whatever they want to and, and whatever's been raised with them by, the, by their constituents and the, and the people that they're here to speak for. Okay, thank you, Emma. Is there, uh, Joe, do you want to come in on that? Yes, um, yeah, I'm delighted to, to join you. Initially, sorry I arrived late. Initially, I was actually using the link for the test yesterday rather than the link for today's meeting. And your, your lady and your secretariat was very helpful in sorting that out for me. She identified the fact that I was using the older link. So it left, I'm at the disadvantage of not having heard some of the initial contributions. Uh, but having said that, I arrived at the point where my colleague, uh, Senator Michael McDowell was speaking. And since that, I've been hearing it. And just to start by responding to Emma at the end, 
Um, I mean, I, I think, and it's a point made by Michael earlier, it's a point generally made now that we have to, we'll ha ultimately be more imaginative than the physical large unit of unity, uh, you know, the unified physical area. We'll have to imagine new solutions, new forms of, of a confederal type solutions, joint authority, uh, you know, there's a number of options will have to be looked at as a, and arrive at Irish, at what is ultimately complete unity by through gradualism, basically, because what we have to avoid in the whole process is that we create, uh, we create a, a paramilitary movement in opposition and, it, and that we, uh, to a united Ireland and that we get into a cycle of violence there. So what we have to do is, uh, is function. I do think, and Emma makes the point, and it was made earlier, I do think there's nothing wrong and there's everything good about us having discussions. I think this whole dialogue today is excellent. I think this is what should be happening a lot more. We should have a lot more exchanges and post uh, the COVID when normality returns, we should be up and down to each other on a very regular basis. We did some of that last year. I remember my colleague Niall O'Donnell was was, um, was uh, in a, a very much a co-host at that stage, and we did a very successful trip to um, to um, Northern Ireland. We should do a lot more of them, but I think we'll have to have a gradualist approach. I mean, I essentially agree with Michael McDowell about this, not because we don't all desire Irish unity, and not because we don't all down here want the riches and everything and the cultural riches the everything that will come with unity and the interaction we all want particularly as a border person i very much look forward to that but i think the dialogue yes the conversations around it now yes the building up of practical areas of cooperation as health which was referenced earlier is a very obvious one education the erasmus right through to re you achieve an effective kind of a unity in practical terms, and then we look imaginatively at structures. And I do subscribe to the view um, that an immediate poll wouldn't be prudent now and might actually damage the cause, but I do equally subscribe to the view that we should be openly talking about it. I do think the Taoiseach in the South let, launched the Shared Island Initiative recently, and while that might maybe seem enough for people, that should be built on, or we certainly should be trying to converse with each other, trying to work together. Um, that's one of the things uh, that I think is is important. On the protocol, I would I came in on the protocol discussion at the point uh, where Michael McDowell, my colleague, was saying that he thought dialogue rather than court cases was the way to go. And of course, that's the case. But I hope that the court case is more a sort of a shot across the bows and an attempt to, uh, you know, uh, establish a position, uh, play, uh, positions and that then discussion will ensue and it will have to be solved at a, at a practical one, you know, level ultimately and will have to be the subject of negotiation. But I think the court case is to establish the right, is to establish the breach of agreement is to establish and i think there's merit in the court in the court announcement of the court case while trying to resolve the matter in a sensible way i it's interesting what martina said earlier about the shortages it's and and then doga think as well that the shortages are not the kind of an issue that appeared at the beginning but just if i might finish by saying i, I think today is a wonderful exercise i uh, what i heard was so so interesting and so encouraging and i do my essential response to emma there which is where i'm coming in after emma is that yes we should be talking yes we should be interacting yes we should be looking at imaginative solutions yes we should be building bridges building interaction building commonalities around health in every economic practical way possible as and building on from that ultimately to looking at structures and then to a referendum that has a, a chance, a real chance of success and a chance of success 
without creating a paramilitary uh, movement for its destruction, for the destruction of the ultimate United Ireland or the, the Northern involvement. And that's the balance you have to strike, I think. And But I do think we won't resolve it today in this forum or across uh, online like this, but we should be talking and we should be interacting. And I finish by saying I'm so convinced that post-COVID, we do need to start travelling up and down across the border and physically meeting and physically talking about these things. But I don't subscribe to the view, finally, that we should shy away from the discussion. Far from it. That's that's getting no one anywhere. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe. Niall, you're looking back in there. Yeah, Chair, my colleagues won't be surprised that, that, that I want to come in on this, but I will be brief because I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of people's time. And uh, Senator McDowell did reference me because he and I have discussed this issue, mostly actually uh, in the plenary session of the Senate as opposed to uh, with each other. But nevertheless, doesn't it tell us something that the conversation uh, here today has, has veered towards this? And that's really reflective uh, of boardrooms, of club rooms, of kitchen tables uh, all around uh, the country in relation to this uh, issue. Uh, I'm glad Joe really made it on to the meeting because I always value uh, his very considered and tempered uh, remarks and input uh, in the meetings such as this. Um, and it's important to remember that, that, that nobody's advocating for a jolt, for a knee-jerk uh, approach to this. Um, that. While demographics, which was discussed earlier, is an element of it, uh, there's also issues of the the end of the political unionist majority over a series uh, of elections. Now there is the added dynamic uh, of Brexit, and I suppose fundamentally, uh, as Pat rightly said, for the work of, of this committee and what we're discussing today, the EU Commission sent us and sent the world a message when they said that a reunified Ireland in line with the provisions of the Good Friday Agreement would be welcomed back into uh, the EU as uh, one unit. So that, of course, has to be a consideration uh, for our thinking and for our work uh, as we move forward in terms of the Shannon Brexit Committee, but indeed our own political work. Um, it's a very important one that I don't think always gets maybe the platform or the consideration that 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 it deserves. But it's good to hear part of the conversation now has has been replicated into this committee. We all, well, we don't all uh, agree, Doug. <laughs> I appreciate you're, you're still on the call. But nonetheless, there's, there, I think there's a, a broad range of views about the outcome and maybe some divergence of views about the time scale. Um, but nevertheless, if Brexit has shown us one thing, it's that that work needs to needs to happen uh, and needs to be considered and needs to be con uh, inclusive. Two final points, Chair. I, I actually think the Shannon is ideally placed to play a central role in that because unlike other institutions, we can actually be nationally representative. We can have uh, uh, members from right across our 32 counties and indeed beyond in terms of our diaspora. We can have members from across uh, political and cultural uh, uh, communities. Um, and finally, Chair, I mean, the, 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 I suppose the, the, the core element of this is that we have to remember and not, not kind of be a la carte about the Good Friday Agreement or not deem parts of the Good Friday Agreement, you know, negative or contentious or divisive. Um, the Good Friday Agreement didn't settle the constitutional question. As I often remain colleagues, it asks us the constitutional question. So it gives us the opportunity to democratically and peacefully uh, and in a considered and informed way change the constitutional status. Um, so if there are sayings, and I disagree with Michael, I, I believe there are sayings pointing towards a desire uh, for constitutional change, then there is an obligation on us in terms of the Good Friday Agreement, but also uh, in the South in terms of uh, the Constitution. And he would be much more familiar with that than I um, in terms of our responsibility to, to do that uh, in, in the best way possible. So um, I just think it's, uh, that those are my points, Chair. I just think it's interesting and it's a wee bit telling that this is where the conversation uh, has gone, because I think that's the life dynamic that's out there, regardless of where you fall down on the issue, and you're perfectly entitled to take whatever view you so wish. So, Shin Mamej, that's me, Colin. Thanks. Thank you, Now, um, I think, Malcolm, you were looking to come in. Yeah, Colin, thanks very much. And just briefly, um, I'm quite struck that a lot of the conversation is, and it has shifted, um, but part of the issues here have been around identity. And, I mean, I was even struck when, you know, Doug, when he was introducing himself, spoke about, you know, somebody who su supported uh, 
you know, that he's defined himself as an Irishman, but as a unionist, uh, that we all kind of talked, Trevor talked about himself as a soft unionist. I suppose from my perspective, I, I define myself as somebody who's Irish, but equally somebody who's passionately um, pro-European. And conscious around, you know, some of these discussions around around identity. And I know now I was saying, you know, some of the constitution questions are coming up at, you know, kitchen tables. I, I'm very conscious that there is, you know, there are probably two significant groups who aren't here in this discussion. Um, and one are, you know, we, we don't have DUP representatives here. There's a significant body of unionist opinion who are threatened by um, some of this uh, conversation. And I, and I guess I, I put the question, what can we do, uh, and particularly in the context of, of, of our Shen report, what can we do to engage those in unionism uh, who come from a very anti-European or Eurosceptic perspective and equally feel threatened by a lot of this discussion? How can we uh, progress to, to allow the DUP and others to feel part of the conversation? And the second, I, I suppose, is, you know, we... We in many ways keep thinking, you know, and, and a lot of the discussion is always around green and orange, but, you know, there are huge numbers of people now who don't define themselves by green and orange. Uh, some are people who um, were born and grew up here, but increasingly because uh, of migration across the European Union, we have significant numbers of people on this island uh, who, um, were, you know, their families weren't originally from Ireland. And I think it is important as well that in any you know, future discussion that we would also talk about those minorities uh, and indeed the, the rich part that they're playing in all of our communities. Thank you very much for that, Malcolm. Um, is there anybody else that would like to, um, Eileen, would you like to come in there? Yes, uh, please, uh, Chair. Uh, just to say, I'm actually new to the Brexit Committee and uh, this has been such an eye-opener for me and probably one of the youngest around the table. I've noticed that there's one important voice that's not representative uh, throughout the both committees and that's young people on both sides of the border, you know, and, and I think it's something that both committees can look at going forward. I know we spoke about uh, education um and the importance of education for all children but also again there's even a bigger for, for me personally as well as being a uh, uh, representing Donegal and that's one Emma, Emma rightly so uh, talked about people uh, having problems with the roads and, and everything else that goes with it. for me the cohort of people um, Michael was talking about in 10 years down the line or maybe sh uh, shorter or longer wh where's the young people in this conversation and both committees really need to look at engaging with uh, youth sir services in, in both sides of the border that we can get the voices of the young people and people from ethnic minority groups as well who don't even really understand uh, Brexit and me myself I'm from the traveller community and you know obviously a lot of people would go over and back uh, from Ireland to England and uh, up the north and back uh, south again and you know it would be interesting obviously to keep to keep meeting and again like this meeting for me personally was so educational listening to everybody but I do think this is only a starting point that there's an awful lot more negotiations that need to be had but with an inclusion of, of young people so hopefully we can get young people to uh, come to both uh, committees that can that can uh, speak on behalf of themselves and what they want to see in their vision of, uh, of, of, of an Ireland of an all Ireland uh, a unity Ireland you know I think it would be really important if we were to look at doing something like that in the future. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. I, I swear Niall was only in school a few years ago and is still a young person. He'll have a good debate with you about that in the future. But no, I think actually, I, as, a, as a former youth worker, I entirely take on the point that everything that we do should be cascaded down uh, and the voice and views of young people uh, sought if they're not part of the representative forums. And uh, certainly I know another element of our uh, work and, and stuff that's in our correspondence today is about the development of a youth parliament uh, within uh, the, the the Northern Ireland Assembly, and I think that you know that there's a real value that discussions that we are having on important matters like this here could be passed to a youth parliament to have their discussion and their views and their thoughts uh, considered and and fed backwards and shared back and forward to really get uh, the strong voice of young people because this is about shaping their future. Uh, and it's better to do that with them rather than just simply for them. So 
uh, it's important conversations. Um, Lisa, I think we're... we're, we're yes, How is it that you're 20 years older than me and have much darker hair, though? <laughs> <laughs> You know, the good looks are natural now. I can do nothing about that, you know. <laughs> no bottles near the head. I see in the background. Unless the 20 years nonsense. Um, Lisa, that's us uh, finished up with questions from our committee. Is there anything else you think that yourself or your members would like to, to put forward? Or um, maybe we could just agree that we will meet again? Yeah, look, just I suppose to say um, from from our perspective, from from the the Shannon Brexit Committee, um, to thank you for the engagement. I think it's been a really worthwhile engagement. Um, you know, I think it was quite a robust debate, uh, back and forth, and good questions and good participation. So, you know, I, I I'm, I'm gathering from around the table that there's a desire to to do this again. Um, you know, and to keep that link going. So, just to thank yourself, Chair, and all the members for extending us the invitation. Thank you. Um, and we we'll we we'll look to do it again. Thank you very much indeed, Lisa, and thank you to all the members that have attended today. And as I say, no doubt these conversations will continue, so we'll meet up again to discuss any further movements that there's been. So thank you very much indeed. And thank what we'll do much. with um, our own members is if we just give two minutes, uh, we'll let people exit the one meeting, and I will simply grab a glass of water as well. So right. we'll two minutes. No, thanks very much, guys. See ya. Lisa, see ya. What have we left, Colin? Very little, very little. So correspondence and forward work plan. So we should just be about another five minutes or so. And we're still live, by the way, as well. We're uh, just just paused rather than stopped. So as soon as we have Martina back, we'll just move in. And also just, I think we need the five of us uh, that are here just uh, for in terms of being quoted to, to make any of the decisions based on any of the things that we're we're discussing. So as soon as we get Martina back, we'll we'll launch into that. So I think there's a lot we can do minus Martina. Michael, have you any advice? Is there, are, are you expecting many decisions in this, this element? It's as much just about note and correspondence and... Yeah, the, the only one chair is uh, oh, the letter asking to present to the car. There we go. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So... Uh, members, we'll move on then to uh, item six, which is correspondence. Now, there's quite a lot. There's 17 items in the uh, meeting pack uh, and a number of items in the table pack that was circulated. Just two or three that are, just to highlight for people. Um, 
there were, is a request in the pack from uh, Carl Neal of Hospitality Ulster to present uh, on the hospitality recovery plan. Now, just on that, we had quite a number of groups with us last week, and that's one group looking to present to us on an issue. With it being about recovery, it may slightly dovetail across the economy committee, and maybe as a suggestion, rather than we obviously don't want to say no to anybody, but if we referred that on to the economy committee for their potential involvement in meeting with them, and also I was going to suggest under the forward work plan that we would um, ask the head of the civil service to come up and give us a presentation on the overall COVID recovery plan uh, and how that would uh, fold into what we did last week with all the people on the high street uh, task force. So would members be agreeable if we refer the, the presentation suggestion to the economy committee and then include some of their comments then for the a discussion with the head of the civil service? Would that be agreeable? Martina? Um, yeah, I don't think we'd have any problem with that. Pat, you can indicate otherwise. But um, I think what's something you might want to consider, the, for instance, the Infrastructure Committee, we're going to have a joint meeting with DERA because of how that cross cuts over with some of the stuff that we're doing and the Committee for the Economy. And given the cross cut nature of some of the work that we do with the Committee for the Economy, we might want to, at some stage in the work programme, consider doing a joint meeting on particular items that are, that are cross cutting. Yeah, I mean, that's very useful. Maybe um, the, in terms of bringing the head of the civil service, I think what I was going to suggest was if all of the groups that presented to us last week um, were able to give us a, a paragraph or two uh, on, on their thoughts of the that we could actually incorporate all of that in to questions and answers with the, the, the that sort of COVID recovery team. But that could be done as a joint meeting with the economy committee if that was uh, uh, if that was agreeable with people. Yeah. Okay. Right, Michael, you're happy enough for that. Um, also, there is correspondence that has come back um, further to a letter that was sent after Trevor's suggestion about the religious institutions and other institutions in terms of insurance companies and potential payments. So I was going to suggest on the back of that that we would ask a the department for some clarity on their progression of that and also that maybe we would invite um, maybe around May, June time, which would be about six months from that work would have commenced. Maybe ask those officials to come up and give us some sort of an update on where how they're getting on uh, with those conversations. But we kind of warn them now that we're going to be asking questions about the insurance angle, which would mean that they've got a month or two to work on that if they haven't already. Would you be happy enough with that, Trevor? Uh, yes, I'm fine with that. Unfortunately, I haven't seen the letter. I apologise for that, but uh, at least we'll have a reply, so let's do it your way. I, I don't. I suspect my reading of the letter is that there isn't an awful lot of information, so I think if we kind of say we're going to be inviting you in about two or three months' time to ask you about this, it might encourage a bit of activity in the next two or three months so that they have something to come and report uh, to us, so it might be a way of preempting that. Okay. Uh, also, just to note, really, I want... Um, that there was a letter from the Scottish Parliament to, to Lord Canal in the House of Lords about asking about where they feel their um, uh, place would be as part of any uh, parliamentary partnership assembly in terms of the Brexit process. And it's just really saying that that's the Scottish Parliament asking. We have likewise asked. So there's maybe just to, to note that there's a bit of momentum gathering there for finding out who would be uh, on such a partnership and how that would happen. They're the only issues that I wanted to know from correspondence. Is there anything else that anybody else would like to raise? Uh, Doug? Yeah, if I can, just very briefly, um, sure. Um, and it's in the table pack, and it's the redress board uh, statistics. Um, uh, and if, if you remember back whenever you were taking your sabbatical when you had COVID, uh, and I was chairing the uh, the meetings, we, uh, we we said we would we would we would get these statistics coming in so we could monitor this. Uh, and I've also been engaged by the, the you know the survivors groups, uh, and they are re really concerned at the pace that the redress panels uh, are moving, um, uh, and that some of them who have yet to apply could could be waiting you know up to five years before they're 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 dealt with. Um, uh, and I just wonder if there's any way we can engage in regards to this because there there clearly needs to be more panels to be able to clear this quicker, and that's an easy fix to it. 
Uh, and there's also an issue in regards to this as well. When you look at the statistics, but you speak to these groups, and I know they've spoken to other MLAs as well, um, that they're still not getting the correct engagements between them, the survivors, uh, and the redress panels. So they have to go through a solicitor instead of a direct engagement policy. Um, is there any way we can do something to, to at least highlight this issue and see if we can get the, the, executive, uh, the executive office doing a little bit more to, to try and uh, improve the situation? Okay, would a suggestion work, Doug, if we make all of those points and, and contact the commissioner, um, given that, that that's her, her role is there? I mean, I fear if we go to the executive, they're simply going to come back and say, well, we've appointed a commissioner, so go there. And the commissioner can directly engage with the groups to capture what those views are and has the, the, the I suppose, the position to be able to contact the redress board and speak to them and, and detail them, that maybe if we put that as a a request for information from or an update from the commissioner and then based on what comes back from there decide if we feel in our scrutiny rule that we would need to take it further yeah and, and Colin, i don't have a i don't have a problem with that and i, and I mean i would ask uh, other members what their thoughts are i guess my only concern is is that the commissioner is still trying to work with a very finite resource mm. uh, and that finite resource is, is 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 not moving as quickly as it should to sure. improve the situation that's why i'm saying Maybe there is an engagement that needs to go to the TEO. Um, I'm not saying we have to. Others may have a different view. I don't mind how we do it. Uh, I, but I do think that the TEO does have a responsibility here to make sure that the commissioner uh, is resourced correctly. And if we need more panels, then we need more panels. Yeah. And if that needs a resource, then they're going to have to provide that. Absolutely. I, I think we should seek those lines and then ultimately, if required, read between them and then act on them. Uh, but I think if we seek those those lines first, then we have the evidence to go back to the committee and, or to the executive and say, well, we've asked the set, we've heard from the sector, from those on the ground, and we've went and asked those that are involved in it, and this is what we're hearing now. What are you going to do about it? That that might, but I, I would like to think that could be pretty quick. I'd hope, Michael, that maybe as we've got a two week break now, that we could get that off. ASAP so that at our next meeting we would have feedback on that to be able to, to decide at that stage that this isn't something that would would take very long. Um, okay, any other member wish to discuss that, that issue? Oh, okay, uh, any other item on the list then for the uh, correspondence that anybody wants to raise? Okay, then I'll move us on to item seven, which is the further or the forward work program. It's on page 129 of the meeting pack. Uh, the committee does have a planning session on, or sorry, we do have a training session on effective questioning on the 5th of May. Um, I was going to make a suggestion that as there's nothing else set aside for that meeting, that we would use that to do a planning meeting for the next year ahead for the rest of this mandate. We can maybe have a quick look at what we've done over the last number of months and then have a look at what we could get uh, plan for the future. I know that's pretty important for the, the 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 clerk and the staff that they know the direction that they want that, that that we want to go in, so that they can go off and start to make the preparations for that. So it's just with your um, support and that or, or, or that meeting on the fifth of May, we, we'll do the the training and uh, do the planning meeting there. So maybe not so much on the political front, but an opportunity for us to get a bit of training and a bit of 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 organising. Uh, and I had mentioned as well um, about maybe the suggestion of bringing the head of the civil service in uh, just to get an update on that COVID recovery and the pathways that they're working on. So we could we could do that. Is, is there any other questions or points in the forward work program? Okay. Uh, any other members or any other business? Oh, my brain's just not working today. <laughs> uh, okay. So nothing else in any other business. Then the date and the time and the place of the next meeting will be in two weeks today. Uh, I think I'll be getting the rest that I'm needing uh, that next Wednesday. I uh, wish everybody a, a happy St. Patrick's Day as best can be enjoyed under the COVID uh, conditions. And I'll see everybody the week after them. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, see you. Bye. Assembly Committee Room 30.